Alright guys, I'll just take one minute of your precious time. Just wanted to let all of you know that if you want to practice all these questions using artificial intelligence and practice on a portal which is as similar as your actual PT exam which will give you exact scores which you are likely to get in your exam, just register on languageacademy.com.au. You can practice as many questions. On top of that, you can get instant feedback, instant scores and instant suggestions on what are the things you need to work on and how to improve your mistakes and turn them into your strength. You can also take a full scored mock test. You'll get a full scorecard. You'll get in-depth analysis. You'll get tutors feedback. One mock test is available for free and four sectional mock tests are available for free. You just need to go on languageacademy.com.au. Register over there. Use Google Chrome, log in and practice and make sure you get your desired score at the earliest. Now you can continue with the video or you can just log on to languageacademy.com.au and practice all these questions over there as well. All the very best. I'll see you very soon. cave in northern Spain. Yes, 50,000 year old dental plaque. And they found a lot lurking between the teeth. Like evidence of nuts, grasses and green veggies, chemical traces of wood smoke, and tiny, intact starch granules, proof Neanderthals ate their carbs. And in one individual, they detected compounds found in the medicinal herbs chamomile and yarrow. Are you studying anything new these days? Well, I started to study about astronomy. Oh, cool. Yeah, I really like stars. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> they're really pretty. I like to watch stars at night at my house because there's really less light. But I don't know about the stellars or stuff. Oh, like constellations. Constellations. Yeah. So... Is there anything that you've been studying these days? Recently started to study cooking. Cooking? Yes. No. Dogs are not just man's best friend. Previous studies have shown that kids with dogs are less likely to develop asthma. Now a new study may show how if results from mice apply to us. The work was presented at a meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. The study tests what's called the hygiene hypothesis. The idea is that extreme cleanliness may actually promote disease later on. Researchers collected dust from homes that had a dog. They fed that house dust to mice. They then infected the mice with a common childhood infection called respiratory syncytial virus or RSV.
Every year, about 10 million tons of paper winds up in American landfills and incinerators, which is not only wasteful but adds CO2 to the atmosphere. Recycling helps, but even that material has to be repulped and paperized before you can use it to print out that recipe you'll never make. But what if you could wipe the page clean and use it again? Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation to the rescue. A new study shows that laser light can erase the toner from a piece of printed paper. The approach appears in the proceedings of the Royal Society A taking a page from the Art Restoration Handbook scientists sampled a variety of light sources to see if any could be used to strip the ink from laser printed documents without damaging or discoloring the paper. UV and infrared were too harsh. Jack Nicholson, playing the crazed caretaker in The Shining, makes me reach for a blanket. Now a study finds that people we find, well, creepy can actually make us feel colder. The research will be published in the journal Psychological Science. Researchers interviewed 40 college undergraduates. During each interaction, the experimenter was either chummy with the student or very stiff and professional. The investigator also alternated between mimicking students' posture a signal of rapport and not doing anything at all. Participants then completed a questionnaire designed to find out how hot or cold they felt. The results showed that the subjects actually felt colder when the investigator acted inappropriately or sent mixed signals. Doctors know a lot about prescribing medications. Take two brisk walks and call me in the morning. But for many patients, a light get moving plan might be just what the doctor should have ordered. Many of us aren't exactly in peak physical condition. But a large number of people are actually deconditioned. So says the Mayo Clinic's Michael Joyner in an essay in the Journal of Physiology. After surgery, illness, pregnancy or extended inactivity for any reason, people might feel faint or fatigued when they try even mild exercise. These signs, Joyner argues, should be recognized by doctors not as symptoms that should be treated with drugs, but rather as a medical state of deconditioning that might be better helped with a gentle, guided exercise program.
The word hormone is derived from a Greek verb that means to excite. Hormones are found in all multicellular organisms and function to coordinate the parts of the organism. A hormone is a chemical signal. It is produced by one part of the body and is then transported to other parts of the body where it triggers responses in cells and tissues. The concept of chemical messengers and plants first emerged from a series of classic experiments on how plant stands respond to light. Think about this. A houseplant on the windowsill grows toward light. If you rotate the plant, it will soon reorient its growth until its leaves again face the window. The growth of a plant toward light is called phototropism in a forest or other natural ecosystem where plants may be crowded. Global warming might seem like a botanical boon. After all, milder temperatures and more carbon dioxide and nitrogen should feed flora. But a 10-year study has found that any initial positive effect on plant growth from climate change may soon disappear. The report is in the journal Nature Climate Change. Researchers transplanted vegetation from four grassland ecosystems to lower, warmer elevations. They also modified the precipitation at the transplant sites based on altered rainfall estimates. For the first year, the plants did great, producing more biomass and churning out more oxygen for us. But their productivity went down for the rest of the decade. What happened? Warming did speed up the nitrogen cycle, which should have increased nitrogen's availability as plant fertilizer. But a lot of the nitrogen left the soil through runoff or uptake into the atmosphere. A lot of people just don't feel quite human without that morning cup of coffee. Now a study finds that the enhanced sense of well-being that caffeine can cause is reflected in our perception of words. Specifically, caffeine increases the ability to recognize words associated with positive thoughts, but doesn't provide the same boost for words with negative or even neutral associations. The research is in the journal PLOS One. Scientists assigned 66 subjects to one of two groups. Half got a 200 mg caffeine tablet, a dose equal to almost three cups of coffee. The other half received a sugar tablet. 30 minutes later the volunteers were shown strings of letters, and had to decide as fast as they could if a string formed a word or was just gibberish.
The government of New South Wales has apologised for the traffic congestion that occurred yesterday in and around Sydney Harbour during the visit of the Queen Mary II and Queen Elizabeth II. Roads were congested, traffic came to a halt, and tram and ferry services were overrun with thousands of extra people, with most services being delayed for hours. Plans were put in place to deal with the congestion, according to Premier Maurice Humour, but the number of tourists far exceeded expectations. Although there appeared to be as much traffic on the harbour as there was on the highways, everyone agreed that it was a spectacular sight. Some interesting facts about the great reptilian fossils recently discovered in Wyoming and Colorado have come to light. The bones found represent reptiles of many sizes, from that of a cat up to 160 feet high. The latter, found at Como, Wyoming, belonged to the crocodile order, but the remains give evidence that the animal stood up on its hind legs, like a kangaroo. Another found in Colorado is estimated to have been 100 feet long. A great many remains of the same general class, but belonging to different species, have been collected and sent east. Among them from 3 to 400 specimens of the dinosaur, and about a thousand pterodactyls, have been shipped from Colorado, Wyoming, and Kansas. The wings of one of the latter were from 30 to 40 feet from tip to tip. Fiber, vitamin A, and calcium are all found in sweet potatoes. However, scientists believe they can make them more healthier in a way that is actually astounding. Researchers discovered that giving sweet potatoes a zap of electricity enhanced the content of antioxidants known as polyphenols by 60%. Sweet potatoes were immersed in a sodium chloride solution by the researchers. They discovered that shocking potatoes with 0.2 amps of direct current resulted in roughly one and a half times more antioxidants than potatoes that were not shocked. The findings were presented at the American Chemical Society's national meeting. The electric shock appears to have induced the potatoes to produce more polyphenols as a defensive mechanism. Millions of roses get handed out on Valentine's Day. But growing roses has an environmental impact worse than many other crops. Start with climate change. Most roses in the US and Europe are imported from warmer climes. 
All that flying and trucking adds thousands of metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Then there's all the water needed to, well, water the flowers. And the runoff fouled by copious quantities of pesticides needed to make the roses look perfect. There's also the wildlife and workers poisoned by all that fumigation. Add to that habitat destruction where floral plantations displace native forest and wetlands. Finally, there's the refrigeration needed to keep those blooms fresh. The electricity is often produced by burning fossil fuels, and the refrigerant gases also exacerbate climate change. A new 3D printing method may pave the door for lighter, faster planes that can travel longer on the same amount of fuel. Thousands of metal rivets and fasteners hold today's aeroplanes together. This is due to the unweldability of the lightweight but robust aluminium alloys utilized in their frames. When you try to weld them, the resulting alloy weakens and cracks as it cools, a phenomenon known as hot cracking. This, along with other negative welding effects, makes 3D printing high-strength aluminium alloy parts difficult. When researchers try it, the resulting laser-fused material flakes away like a stale biscuit at the welding spot. All of this, of course, applies to your final project. So that's exactly what we'll do. So date, the predominant technique of interviewing the window has been face-to-face -face interviews. Today, we'll look at how to use an email and why it works, why it doesn't always work, what the issues are, and some of the things to keep in mind when completing such interpretations. Let's begin with the one from a different country. Obviously. They have some benefits, which are outlined on the slide. For those of you who are apprehensive about the interview process, it is definitely less stressful. Dams are massive man-made structures that serve as river barriers. 
The primary motivation for dam construction nowadays is to generate power. They can also be used to control and restrict the flow of water in rivers. Dams have been used to avert flooding and irrigate agriculture throughout history. Dams generate nearly a sixth of the world's electricity and help to mitigate flood and drought risks. They also make water more accessible, particularly in desert-like locations where water is scarce. However, there are significant drawbacks to damming rivers. Many people's homes are demolished to make way for the dam, and flooding is a possibility in the reservoir, which is located near the dam where water collects. Another way in which the industry exerts pressure on doctors is by offering us a variety of professional services. In one of these services, widely advertised to GPs, a company representative shows the practice manager how to use a company disc to trawl through the practice database identifying patients with problems which might be treatable with the company's products. When that has been done, a company-sponsored nurse interviews the selected patients and draws up a management plan for the GP which, if approved by the doctor, attracts a Medicare item number. One of these companies proudly announces that over 65,000 patients were assessed in this way in 2005. What, one may ask, is a pharmaceutical company doing assessing patients? It is surprising that no government or professional body has stepped in to prevent this commercially sponsored program. You like to go shopping. Yeah, pretty much, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you look very fashionable. You have many accessories. Yeah, yeah. I like underground fashion pretty much. I see. Yeah. Actually, it's, um, how could I say? Uh, I'm a shopaholic. Oh, a shopaholic. Do you spend <laughs> a lot of money then? La, 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 la. <laughs> I think, yes, I I think, think that I is do. a yes. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. Money.
and one crop in particular, almond, is transforming the world of beekeeping and bees, first in the United States and now in Australia. What happened was that something serendipitous happened, and consumers and doctors found that almonds are healthy, even if they are a sweet treat. The Almond Board is actively promoting almonds in a very aggressive manner. As I recently learned, they really send out salespeople to hospitals to pitch the benefits of almonds to cardiologists. Almonds are getting a lot of attention, and it's a fair campaign because almonds are a healthy snack. Well, the simple explanation might be that yesterday's sudden drop in share prices pretty much across the board has created what market analysts like to call a buying opportunity. It tends to bring out investors to pick through the ruins, looking for bargains decision by investors that sellers got a little carried away with things so the buyers have lifted all the major indexes today. The Dow, the Nasdaq, the S&P 500 were all up around half a percent in early trading today, and that wasn't a big surprise. The sell-off continued somewhat overseas European markets remain fairly weak, along with many of the Asian markets. But you'll remember that all this started with a big plunge of around 9% on the stock market in Shanghai. Well, Chinese rebounded by around 4%. Is he or she genuinely pleased to see me? Or are they simply being courteous? Some individuals can't tell the difference between a false grin and a genuine smile. This work has become much more difficult for computers, at least until researchers build a method to recognize when a smile is genuine. Researchers at the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom began by developing software to simulate changing face expressions. This computer can analyze a video of a human head and pinpoint characteristics around the eyes, cheeks, and mouth. The program then follows the details as they move in relation to one another when the face grins. The scientists then used their software to analyze two sets of video samples.
With a population of just over 300 million people, America has roughly 250 million cars. The majority of those vehicles, of course, are gasoline-powered. This presents a serious challenge, given the finite supply of oil and the mounting urgency of the global warming crisis. However, there is some good news, according to our guests today. And it's because we have the know-how and technology to design beautiful, fast cars that don't rely on fossil fuels. These futuristic autos are powered by hydrogen, energy, biofuels, and digital technologies. They've already made their presence felt. So, what's holding us back from putting them on the roads? Today's visitors will aid us in answering these questions. Social harm originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime, that essentially, focuses on individual acts of harm, things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations and nation-states cause. But laterally the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology so there are a group of writers who think that and I would include myself there that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society, to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. Candace Galen is based at the University of Missouri, in Columbia. And, being a biologist, she thought, why not use this astronomical phenomenon to study a biological one? Specifically, as the skies darkened, would daytime pollinators, like bumblebees and honeybees, call it quits? What better activity during an eclipse than to go out with a recorder and record the bees? So Galen asked 400 citizen scientists including young students to place audio recorders in 16 flower patches along the path of totality, in Oregon, Idaho and Missouri. When they analyzed the audio, they found that during partial eclipse, bee buzzing continued. But when totality hit, the bees went silent and only the conversational buzz of human observers could be heard.
Green chemistry is a concept aimed at developing technologies that allow chemistry to be conducted with little environmental impact or in an environmentally friendly manner, and it encompasses both chemical processes and chemical products. About seven or eight years ago, the facility was established. And the aim was to create a hub of activity that included basic research, international collaboration, educational development for public awareness of the project, and networking, so we could connect with over 1,000 people all over the world. What I'm trying to figure out, and what my colleagues are trying to figure out, is how we got from that frigid climatic condition to the warm climate condition we have now. We know from ice core study that the transition from cold to warm circumstances was not seamless, as the steady rise in solar energy would suggest. We know this from ice cores, since drilling down into ice reveals annual bands of ice, which can be seen in the iceberg. Those blue-white layers are visible. Gases are trapped in ice cores, allowing scientists to quantify CO2, which is why we know CO2 levels were lower in the past. The chemistry of the ice also reveals information about temperature in the polar regions. The way I look back in the past is by using the fossilized remains of deep water corals. You can see an image of one of these corals behind me. It was collected from close to Antarctica, thousands of meters below the sea, so, very different than the kinds of corals you may have been lucky enough to see if you've had a tropical holiday. So I'm hoping that this talk will give you a four-dimensional view of the ocean. Two dimensions such as this beautiful two-dimensional image of the sea surface temperature. This was taken using satellite, so it's got tremendous spatial resolution. The overall features are extremely easy to understand. The equatorial regions are warm because there's more sunlight. The polar regions are cold because there's less sunlight. You know, without getting into the details of exactly how that happened or how she got it out, let's just say it was a bad situation. And she panicked because, like for many of us, 
her phone is one of the most used and essential tools in her life. But, on the other hand, she had no idea how to fix it, because it's a completely mysterious black box. So, think about it. What would you do? What do you really understand about how your phone works? What are you willing to test or fix? For most people, the answer is, nothing. In fact, one survey found that almost 80% of smartphone users in this country have never even replaced their phone batteries, and 25% didn't even know this was possible. I would have guessed a Wild West performer was practicing with a bullwhip while also vacuuming, but no. That sound is apparently produced by the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. Since 2000 researchers at Finland's Aalto University have been collecting audio, as part of what's called the Auroral Acoustics Project. Folk tales have long held that the lights also produce odd sounds, but the claims were hard to prove and some researchers thought that any noises produced by the energetic particles that caused the light show would be far too high in the sky to be heard on the ground. But the latest results indicate that at least some sounds are produced very close to the ground. Have you ever wanted to turn down the volume at a deafening concert or noisy bar? Envy the whale. A new study finds that toothed whales can reduce their own auditory sensitivity when they expect a loud sound. The work is presented at this week's Acoustics 2012 meeting. Whales and dolphins rely on their responsive hearing to interpret returning echolocation clicks. Previous research suggested that these marine mammals could dull their hearing before uttering outgoing echolocation clicks, which are very loud. Could they use the same coping mechanism for external noises? To find out, researchers trained a false killer whale that a loud noise would always follow a brief warning signal. These two paintings, both called, sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, 
and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example. The only genuinely productive, long-term approach to removing excess carbon dioxide from the environment is to rebuild carbon-rich agriculture soils. She is dissatisfied that scientists and politicians do not see the same opportunities that she does. Australia will release just over 600 million tons of CO2 this year. By raising soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of farms, we can sequester 685 million tons of carbon. We could sequester all of the world's carbon emissions if we increased it on all farms. At the very least, Alex, the National Association of Realtors has placed the champagne on ice. The minor increase in sales of previously owned homes, according to the Industry Association, indicates that the housing market is now stabilizing, which is the first indicator of a recovery. That is, of course, an interpretation of the data. Alex and one that comes from an organization that is known for being a cheerleader for the housing market, as its members are mostly realtors who have been losing a lot of money during the downturn. Now, for a more realistic perspective, I spoke with Carl Case, a housing economist at Wellesley College, who says the tiny increase in sales scarcely compensates for the fact that sales are down 20% from last year.
I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them and obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing. You know, there's almost something for everybody there. And there are so many different aspects of it. You know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there and so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible. Excuse me, is this seat free? Yes. Thanks. My name is Mrs. Smith. It is nice to meet you. Hi Mrs. Smith. My name is Mr. Bean. It's nice to meet you too. Where are you from, Mr. Bean? You sound like you're not from England. I am from Thailand. I have been visiting my family in Manchester. How about you? Same as every day at this time on my way to work, as usual. What do you do? I am an English teacher. My students love learning English. How about you? The term, ethics, refers to a collection of moral requirements that determine what is right and wrong in our actions and decisions. Many professions have a defined code of ethics that serves as a guide for professionals in the industry. Doctors, for example, frequently take the Hippocratic Oath, which states, among other things, that they, do no damage, to their patients. Engineers follow an ethical code that states, the public's safety, health, and welfare are essential. The ideas become so embedded in these professions, as well as in science, that practitioners rarely have to think about following them. It's just how they work. Air pollution has just recently been recognized. In a closed atmosphere, it's not uncommon to feel as if you're suffocating. 
It is frequently attributed to a shortage of oxygen. Fortunately, the composition of air is very consistent throughout the globe. The air contains roughly 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, with the remaining gases making up a very minor amount. True, carbon dioxide emitted from the lungs can collect in a confined and overcrowded space. However, unless the area is completely airtight, such an increase is usually minor and only lasts a short time. In a closed environment, deadly gases such as carbon monoxide can be inhaled. A green corridor is the term used to describe the traditional way of carrying organs by road. This procedure comprises police escorting an ambulance through traffic so that it can reach its destination as quickly as possible. Typically, a special traffic lane is established and all traffic signals along the route remain green. On most circumstances, a green corridor is a path cleared and fenced off by traffic cops to facilitate the smooth and steady transit of harvested organs to those in need of a life-saving transplant. Organs have a short preservation duration, such as the heart, which must be harvested and transplanted within four hours, or the lungs, which can be stored for up to three months. Those who are enthusiastic and optimistic find it easy to learn the art of living. We may learn a lot about the art of life by looking into the lives of people who are humble and simple, as well as outstanding leaders in history, science, and literature. The daily routines of these great individuals indicate not only their various, possibly distinct lifestyles, but also certain habits and practices that they followed. Here are a few. Read them, appreciate them, and follow in their footsteps as you see fit. A private workspace is usually beneficial. Jane Austen requested that a particular noisy hinge never be oiled so that she would be alerted whenever someone entered the room where she wrote. The important thing to remember is that working harder equals working smarter. What methods do you use to work smarter? All you need are the necessary talents. People want better surroundings and a better life but not necessarily a better self. 
They want to win without having to pay a price or do any effort. It is impossible to achieve one without the other. Any advances that are not the result of self-improvement are superficial and fleeting. You must modify yourself if you wish to have a better future. Don't be concerned about the different problems that will face you. Simply trust in yourself and use these obstacles as stepping stones. Success means attaining what you want out of life without infringing on other people's rights. The ocean floor is home to a diverse range of plant and animal groups. The Great Barrier Reef, a 2,000-kilometer-long coral structure off Australia's northeastern coast, is an example of a marine environment near the water's surface. Solar energy is required for the growth of coral reefs, as it is for practically all complex living societies, photosynthesis. The sun's energy, on the other hand, barely reaches around 300 meters below the water's surface. The deep ocean floor is a chilly environment with few life forms due to the comparatively modest penetration of solar light and the sinking of cold, subpolar water. On the Galapagos Islands, geologists discovered hot springs at a depth of 2.5 kilometers in 1977. Never before has a multinational corporation's carbon footprint been scrutinized so closely. To conduct face-to-face -face business meetings, intercity rail travels and long-haul flights contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions and the associated burden on the environment. Toleris, an Anglo-American firm, has launched a new video conferencing technology and teamed with the carbon-neutral company to help businesses become more environmentally conscious. Simulated face-to-face -face meetings can now take place across continents without the time constraints or environmental impact of international travel. Previous designs allowed for point-to-point -point video conferencing. Teens write for a variety of reasons, including completing a school assignment, maintaining contact with friends, sharing their artistic creations with others, and simply putting their ideas on paper, whether virtual or otherwise. Teens indicated they are more motivated to write when they may choose topics that are relevant to their life and interests, and they enjoy school writing more when they can express themselves artistically. Teens are also motivated by teachers or other adults who push them, offer them with fascinating curricula, and provide them with detailed feedback. Teens say that writing for an audience inspires them to write.
Zika is more pernicious than public health officials anticipated. At present, it is circulating in more than 50 countries. And as of mid-May, seven countries or territories have reported cases of microcephaly or other serious birth defects linked to the virus, which is transmitted by mosquito bite, blood transfusion or sexual contact with an infected human. It can also be passed from mother to fetus during pregnancy. Despite Zika's vast range over almost 70 years, there is little genetic difference among the various strains, according to an analysis by researchers at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. For example, the strain currently in the Americas and another previously detected in French Polynesia are practically indistinguishable from each other, group in white box. Most people infected with the virus will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatment. However, some will become seriously ill and require medical attention. Older people and those with underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, or cancer are more likely to develop serious illness. Anyone can get sick with COVID-19 and become seriously ill or die at any age. The best way to prevent and slow down transmission is to be well informed about the disease and how the virus spreads. Protect yourself and others from infection by staying at least one meter apart from others, wearing a properly fitted mask, and washing your hands or using an alcohol-based rub frequently. Curbing dangerous climate change requires very deep cuts in emissions, as well as the use of alternatives to fossil fuels worldwide. The good news is that countries around the globe have formally committed as part of the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement to lower their emissions by setting new standards and crafting new policies to meet or even exceed those standards. The not-so-good news is that we're not working fast enough. To avoid the worst impacts of climate change, scientists tell us that we need to reduce global carbon emissions by as much as 40% by 2030. For that to happen, the global community must take immediate, concrete steps to decarbonize electricity generation by equitably transitioning from fossil fuel-based production to renewable energy sources like wind and solar.
Pollution is a severe problem in today's world. There are four kinds of pollution, air, water, soil and noise pollution, and they are all dangerous. When there are unwanted objects, smells or anything like that in the air, water, or soil, they are called pollutants. Some examples of pollutants are plastic in oceans, smoke in the air from vehicles, etc. When industries decide to make factories in rural areas like villages and small towns, they also build good roads and other proper buildings around the factory. This is so that people can do work in factories with ease. When industries do this, it is called urbanization. Many small towns have become big centers of development and factory work. Education can be an effective weapon for the people, but nowadays, it is mostly governed by corruption. To improve the development of a country, all the citizens of that country should be educated. Still, in many circumstances, they are not able to achieve it due to financial differences. If education is made free, then the country will start developing the country, which will lead the country in the right direction. Education should be accessible to everyone because an educated citizen acts as a more productive citizen. Nearly every country in the developed world provides free primary and secondary education to its citizens. Nowadays millions of people are using tobacco around us and smoking cigarettes. These are still in the market due to the absence of strong rules and regulations. Tobacco is destroying the whole world slowly. It has a very adverse impact on the environment. There would be a 5% reduction in global deforestation because approximately 500,000 acres a year get destroyed due to tobacco farming. Tobacco has been around for many years and it should be stopped but the economy cannot handle it. The tobacco reaching our children and non-smokers as well and destroy their life. Many organizations are working to convince people to stop smoking but it is really hard because people are already addicted. They accept the negative effects of tobacco and continue to smoke cigarettes.
In the digital era in which we currently live, technology plays a vital role. With each passing day, new software or gadget is being introduced in the tech market that improves our lives in one way or another and makes it much more comfortable. The mode of education was never the same, and it has changed continuously. In the beginning, there were no books or notebooks, students used to learn whatever their teacher used to teach the class itself. After the invention of paper and pen, slowly the process moved and today we have technology in our new mode of learning. Technology introduced in the classroom helps the students understand and learn what they are being taught. Now crack your PTE sitting at your home. Language Academy brings to you the smartest AI-powered practice portal, with instant scores and feedback for all the tasks. Along with the practice questions, access free sectional and full mock tests, and get instant scorecard with in-depth feedback and analysis. For more hidden secrets, tips, strategies, and proven templates, click the link below and subscribe to our video course today. Thank you.